Rent, food, college, childcare, you name it, everything is just too expensive. Department of Housing and Urban Development Secretary Marsha Fudge said this week, quote, the rent is too damn high. A recent Harvard University report found that half of U.S. renters are paying rent considered to be unaffordable, spending 30 percent or more of their income on rent and utilities. According to the report, black and brown renters are paying 50 percent or more of their earnings on rent. Meanwhile, it has come to light that 15 states have decided not to participate in summer EBT, a federal food program that provides additional supplementary grocery buying benefits to low-income families with school-aged children during the summer when school is not in full session. And parents and students are scrambling over FAFSA forms. The free application for federal student aid got a late start this past year, launching in December rather than in October. And when they were released, many complications led to the forms getting taken down. And officials now say that information from the FAFSA forms will not be given to schools until March. This leaves families in limbo about where they can send their children to school per the Hill. So very sad. I was a Pell Grant recipient. If I did not have FAFSA on the table, I would have not been able to go to college. Absolutely devastating. More pressing, though, is people not being able to afford to rent in the cities they live and work. That's insane. Of course, you know, college, I considered just taking my trade school degree. I went to trade school for agriculture. I was in the FFA because it really seemed that after the financial crisis and in the recession, college was not at all possible for me. But it was very obvious that our most pressing needs were making ends meet, keeping a roof over our heads and food on the table. It seems to me that most Americans living paycheck to paycheck, most Americans don't have a thousand dollars for an emergency. The situation is dire for everyday working people. They're barely hanging on by a thread. And uh, there's not a lot of movement on the recent legislation to prevent hedge funds uh, from purchasing single family homes. Because while we see rent going up tremendously, it's not like there's an option uh, for people to save and then purchase a home. The affordability of homes has you know, skyrocketed. It, homes are barely affordable in the United States now. And a, a big part of that is because we have these huge corporate conglomerates and financial firms investing in single family homes, which is driving up the rent as well. No, you're absolutely right. And um, I, too, was a Pell Grant recipient, a first-generation college student, uh, went off to a four-year university with an expected family contribution on my FAFSA, EFC of zero. Um, as a student who had an incarcerated parent, I was an independent student, I had to work three jobs while going through school. I think that one of the things that we have to recognize is that the America that our parents and grandparents walked into is not the America we are in right now. And a lot of people have seismic debt, whether it's student loan debt, particularly black and brown Brown students, but also um, debts associated with credit card bills. We've seen that rise astronomically since the pandemic. And many people are just in over their heads. They are underwater. Child care costs aren't affordable in any city in America, yet we still hear time and time again, hey, why are millennials not having kids? You know why? Because the affordability of that is out of reach for the majority of America. So I, I do think there's something to be said about these costs just going up, 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 and up, and more and more people kind of resorting to, specifically with housing costs, going Going back to live with their parents, I'll tell you this, there isn't a single person who goes off to college or goes to a trade school or has a skill who grows up and says, you know what I want to do after I get a job? I want to go back and live with my mama and daddy. <laughs> that is not what is happening across this country, but it's what a lot of young people are being forced into, quite frankly, because rent is not affordable. And it's not affordable in any city in America. When we think of rent affordability, the cities that pop out for most people are obviously New York. You're going to get a closet and pay thousands of dollars, um, L.A., uh, big Big cities. But at the end of the day, we're even looking at places across the South that are extremely unaffordable for people on a daily basis. Wages have not grown to the extent that the rise in rent and housing costs have. Uh, utility bills are out of reach for people. We know that there is a struggle for many folks across this country. And I think that's one of the reasons why, um, even though the economy shows signs of brightness, that people back home on the ground aren't necessarily feeling it because at the end of the day, they can't afford housing. 
Absolutely. Time and again, it's been stated that, you know, the U.S. economy is doing quite well because GDP is high. GDP is not a metric that's representative of how well everyday people are doing in the United States of America. It's a, it's a metric that tells us the total dollar amount of the goods and services produced, which when you have wages stagnant, as you've pointed out, since the 70s, especially when they're adjusted for inflation, we look at the price of a home it's astronomically outpacing the standard rate of inflation. In the 1950s, the median value of a home was about $7,300. Now it's around $80,000. Uh, and that number is from 2020. It's much higher today. We've seen the price of homes go up so much. People can't afford to live on the wages they're being paid. That's a huge problem when it comes to how we're regulating corporations. That's really where this starts. You have Walmart and you have McDonald's, which are two of the top employers of people on Medicaid and people on SNAP benefits or food stamps. Now, when we consider these programs, you always hear the narrative that there are freeloaders using government programs. These are people, 70% of the, of the 9 million wage earners on Medicaid and 4.5 million on SNAP benefits are working full time. So are we subsidizing Walmart and McDonald's in that case if public dollars going to fund these programs are paying for their workers' ability to live while we have a new flat tax on corporations of 21%? Walmart's profits were 12 billion last year alone. So the the situation in the US economy is is not so good. And it's mostly because we haven't regulated corporations to pay their workers a fair wage, to use their profits in a sustainable or meaningful way. Instead, what's been considered is returns to shareholders, which has led to the return on capital investments to be far higher than the return on actual labor, people making things with their hands. And so it's a really tough situation, but it's one that needs to be corrected before it's too late. And one of the biggest ways to do that is to let more working people get educated to ensure they have the resources that they need to meet their most basic needs so that they can continue to work while there's some sort of regulation on the capital capture of America's corporate class. Preach, Jess, preach. And I love that you brought up the fact that the overwhelming majority of those who are on these supplemental assistance programs who are using food stamps, who are using Medicaid, are people who work full time every single day, um, destroying the narrative that these are lazy freeloaders, which for whatever reason, Republicans tend to continue to push. Um, more rising after this.